August 6, 1944. This week, Warsaw rises and the Nazis show us clearly why they began this war. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. When we left the Polish Home Army, the Armia Krajowa, Commander Tadeusz Burkomorowski had ordered Andrzej Kruszczel Monter that Warsaw shall rise against its German occupiers on August 1st, beginning at 1700 hours. It's an act of desperation that Burkomorowski hopes will give the Polish a better chance to negotiate with the Soviets, who, as they advance into Poland, have begun dismantling the Armia Krajowa and sending uncooperative fighters and officers into Soviet exiles in the Gulag camp system. The Soviet forces stand in the eastern suburbs of Praga on the other side of the Vistula River, locked in a stalemate with their German enemy. Their commander, Konstantin Rogosovsky, has no viable route into Warsaw at this point, and even if he did, Soviet de facto dictator Josef Stalin has expressed vocal opposition to an uprising in Warsaw and in general to any support for the Armia Krajowa's fight to liberate Poland. Let me go back to the days before the uprising begins, though. It's easy to think that the war is something that leaves the world loud with explosions enveloped in a bank of gunpowder smoke, constantly deadly, dirty, and dark. Occupied cities with empty streets, silent like ghost towns, only interrupted by columns of German soldiers and military vehicles. But that is nowhere close to reality, though. Sure, the dark clouds of Nazi oppression and murder hang heavy over the people of Warsaw. The scars of battle from 1939 are everywhere to be seen. The gaping hole of rubble that was the Warsaw Ghetto and is now a concentration camp is there, but not visible from most of the city. The blight of Germans in uniform is a constant reminder of the state of affairs, but the German occupiers are far from the majority of people moving through the streets. Generally speaking, Poland's capital has been cleaned up. It's summer, so the parks are green again. People have work to do, family to care for, friends to meet, and entertainment to be had. The draconian restrictions on Polish culture imposed in 1940 and 41 were eased a bit last year. The occupiers hope that some music, some theater, and reopened museums will ease the mood and keep the Poles more pliable. It's totally manipulated by Nazi propaganda, of course, but there's a vibrant underground Polish cultural scene as well. August 1st is a Tuesday. Shops are open and people are out. For most Varsovians, it's not very different from Tuesday the week before and the week before that and so on. Except perhaps the news that the Allies are not far away, in the suburbs even, and soon war might come to Warsaw again, but not today. There's also been talk of an uprising, but no one knows when and where it will begin, if it will begin at all. So when this Tuesday afternoon is interrupted by the sudden appearance of countless groups of young armed insurgents wearing red and white armbands, it's just as surprising to the Varsovians as it is to the Germans. They too have heard rumors of an uprising, many, many times, but the unrealistic prospect of an insurgent rabble, an army trying to take a huge city like Warsaw, 250 square kilometers inside, defended by an organized, heavily armed military of 13,500, with tens of thousands more in reserves, has left them complacent. A German military administrator in the city will be captured later in the war and give this account of the day. In spite of our preparations, the Warsaw Rising caught us by surprise. The office was a madhouse. Telephone, telegraph, and telex lines were jammed. Dozens of experts started pawning through my archives. They concluded that our intelligence reports were outdated and that the frequent rumors of an impending rising was planted from the home army and designed to mislead. That doesn't mean that we knew nothing of what was coming, far from it, but our information was completely inadequate. And so the initial attack of the Armia Krajowa is relatively successful, but costly. The insurgents are organized in battalions, companies, and platoons, but with the semi-autonomy of guerrilla units, which they arguably are. 
they have divided the city into eight city districts and each district into wards. To attack and take these, they have 600 command units between 50 and 100 strong, close to 45,000 fighters. They outnumbered the Germans more than three times, but that's misleading. The Germans have a lot of arms and equipment, while the Anya Krajowa only have guns for roughly every second fighter in a platoon. They will rotate these guns to whoever is on active duty, attack with improvised explosive devices, and capture arms from the enemy or fallen comrades. So the Germans are outnumbered, but the Poles are outgunned. The fighting is immediately heavy, with fierce resistance by the Germans. By nightfall, 2,500 Polish fighters are dead and 500 Germans. But the Armia Krajowa is in control of large parts of the city. However, they have not managed to capture the bridges over the Vistula and the airport, key objectives that were supposed to guarantee continued advances. They are also scattered and cut off from each other, as is their enemy. Tragically, hundreds of thousands of civilians are also caught between the meandering front lines that cut the city into an impossible-to-navigate puzzle. Many tens of thousands are stuck in the place they happened to be when the fighting began, without any possibility to go home or reunite with family. On the second day of fighting, paper boys openly distribute the Home Army's information bulletin, keeping the population abreast of developments and instructing them on things like burials, how to shelter, and how to support the rising. In the following two days, the fighting grows harsher, and people start to go underground into Warsaw's multi-storied cellars. But the insurgents make more gains, even capturing two German tanks and turning them on their previous owners. On the third night, a Polish squadron of the RAF drop in arms and equipment, but it's far from enough to tip the scales. In spite of everything, by August 4th, the insurgents have managed to set up a defensive line in the western suburbs of Wola and Ohota. Now, you might think that all of this troubles the Nazi leadership, but if so, you're mistaken. When Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler hears of the news, he's delighted. On August 3rd, he is in Poznan. Here he speaks of how the war is the beginning of an irreversible racial realignment of the East that is independent of military success. In his actions and notes in the next days, he makes it clear that he sees the rising as an opportunity to finally raise Warsaw with the ground and strike at the heart of Polish culture. Governor of the Generalgouvernement, occupied Poland, Hans Frank, also sees it that way. Buoyed by the success of a German panzer counterattack against Rokosovsky's forces, Frank writes on August 4th. For the most part, Warsaw is in flames. Burning down the houses is the most reliable means of liquidating the insurgents' hideouts. Indescribable poverty reigns among the million inhabitants. Warsaw will be punished with complete destruction after the suppression or collapse of the rising. Unfortunately, our own losses are considerable. But thanks to the improved situation on the Soviet front, one can count on the total crushing of the insurrection by the continuing siege within a few days. German Führer Adolf Hitler agrees and orders Himmler to do exactly that, crush and destroy Warsaw and all its inhabitants. For that job, Himmler turns to some of the worst he has. SS Obergruppenführer Erich von embach Selevsky arrives on August 4th to take command of a German counterattack. We've seen him and his mass murderous activities before. At his side are his chief of staff, SS Gruppenführer Heinz Reinefahrt, and SS Oberführer Oskar Dielewanger, infamous for his brutal repression acts against civilians on the Eastern Front. At their command are a battalion of the SS Rona Brigade from the Russian National Liberation Army under Brigadenführer Mechislav Kaminsky, a union of two battalions formed by the Dielavanga Sonderkommando and the 111th Azerbaijani Regiment, the 572nd and 580th Cossack Battalions, the 608th Special Defense Battalion from Breslau under Oberst Willi Schmidt, a Poznanian Militarized Police Battalion, a Luftwaffe Guard Regiment, and a Reserve Battalion of the Hermann Göring Panzer Parachute Division. Including the units already in Warsaw, von den bach now commands 39,000 men armed to their teeth and ready to face off with Bur Komorowski and Monter's poorly armed 45,000 men and women. But on the first day, on the battlefield, it isn't the Amia Krajowa that von den bach men will mainly fight. By now, the failure to capture the airport is becoming a serious problem. 
Junker 87 and Messerschmitt 109 fighter bombers are pounding the insurgent positions. But the defensive line in Vola and Ohota holds. It is here that the Germans attack. They press the Polish line back, but again they can't penetrate it. So instead of continuing to fight the insurgents, they go on an orgy of violence and murder in the parts of Ohota and Vola that they hold, raping, torturing, burning, and shooting their way from house to house. No one is spared. Babies, nuns, priests, nurses, doctors, little children, pregnant mothers, the elderly, anyone that is in their path is massacred. The most brutal units are the German and Azerbaijani units under Dielewanga and the Russians under Kaminsky. By the second day, the last day of the week, estimates are up to 50,000 dead non-combatants in two days only. Even von dem Bach Selevsky's second-in-command, Reinefahrt, is taken aback by the scale. Worried about his ammunition stores, he complains to his chief, we just can't kill them all. To boot, the rampage and splintered fighting is hindering German reinforcements from reaching the front line with Rokosovsky in Praga. In the evening, von dem Bach Selevsky issues new orders, only men are to be shot. Einsatzgruppen shall handle these murders. Women and children are to be taken prisoner and sent to a transit camp 16 kilometers outside the city. If that order has any effect, remains to be seen next week. Many hundreds of kilometers to the west, in Amsterdam, a more personal drama is unfolding at the hands of the SS. On the morning of August 4, 1944, SS Hauptscharführer Karl Silberbauer and at least two Dutch Sicherheitsdienst investigators arrive at Prinzengracht 263, Amsterdam. The building houses Gießen Company, a pectin and spice company, and warehouse employees direct the team to offices upstairs. Here they find, among others, the managing director, Victor Kugler, and proceed to question him. They then take Kugler with them in a search of the building. It is unclear if this is a regular house search or something more specific, but Silberbawa and his team soon discover a movable bookcase that leads to a secret annex. Inside that annex are Hermann, Auguste and Peter van Pels, Fitz Pfeffer and Otto, Edith, Margot and Anne Frank. They have been in hiding for 761 days. It is possible that the group was betrayed by someone, but it is also possible that Silberbauer and his men raided Prinzengracht 263 in search of illegal ration coupons and other evidence of black marketeering, and finding the annex's residence occurred in the course of the search. Nevertheless, they are all gathered downstairs, hands in the air. Silberbauer allows them to pack some belongings, but otherwise confiscates all valuables. He packs these in a suitcase containing Anne's diary entries, emptying the papers onto the floor. The officers then arrange for transport and take away the eight inhabitants plus Kugler and another office worker, Johannes Kleimann. One of those pages, now laying strewn across the floor, contains an entry less than two weeks old, on July 21st, where Anne records her optimism that was finally growing after hearing the news of the assassination attempt on German Führer Adolf Hitler. In a rush of words, Anne wrote excitedly how this must mean the German war effort would completely collapse soon, and that she may even return to school as soon as October. Her arrest has killed that dream, and even though German forces are indeed collapsing everywhere, their total surrender is yet to come. Moreover, the trigger for Anne's arrest may be unclear, but across Western Europe, Nazi agents have continued rounding up the last Jews they can find. On July 20th and 24th, the Paris Gestapo raided the children's homes of the UGIF, Union Générale des Israélites de France, General Union of French Israelites, that was set up at the order of Vichy authorities at the request of the Germans. It is a morally complex organization, but has often tried to save Jews from their fate. And these homes house Jewish children whose parents had already been deported. Resistance organizations had pleaded with the leadership of the UGF to disband the homes and allow the children to be hid clandestinely, but to no avail. 258 children and 30 adults are arrested and deported to Auschwitz. Across the next few weeks, the last deportation trains will leave Western Europe as the Allies draw nearer. 
The total number of Jews deported across the years will be 104,000 from the Netherlands, 73% of the pre-war Jewish population, 25,000, 44% from Belgium, and 75,000, 22% from France. Altogether, this is 3.5% of the total number of Jewish victims of the Holocaust. A small percentage, but also a testament to the genocidal drive of the Nazi regime and how it systematically rounded up and deported Jews to camps over a thousand kilometers away, only to gas most of them immediately upon arrival. Both the numbers and percentages are higher in the East, in part because there the Jewish share of population is higher, but also because of the brutality that the German Nazis and their helpers dare exercise in their persecution. In Poland, 90% of the pre-war Jewish population will be murdered. In Czechoslovakia, 73%. In Greece, 91%, and so on. It is a determination that goes back to the heart of the Nazi belief that they are fighting this war against the Jews, who, according to them, are behind the entire Allied war effort. A fortnight ago, on July 21st, the day after the assassination attempt against him, Hitler received Bela Miklos, the chief of the Hungarian war office at the Wolfslayer. Hitler was furious at Hungarian regent Miklos Horthy for pausing deportations in mid-July. Horthy was arguably trying to thread the needle between the German occupiers and the approaching Red Army, fearing that a lack of opposition to the Nazi genocide will leave him in a difficult position when the Allies arrive, or perhaps even hoping to defect all of Hungary to the Allied side. He refused, and still refuses, to budge, even under heavy pressure. At the Wolfslayer, Hitler expressed his displeasure to Miklos and emphasized the Nazi view that it is the Jews who are the force behind the Allied attacks on Hamburg and other cities, making them responsible for tens of thousands of German civilian casualties. He repeated his trope from before the war that if the Jews believe they can destroy Europe, they will find themselves the first to be destroyed. Whether or not Miklos believes any of this murderous nonsense, he's not ready to support Hitler's demands. When he returns to Budapest and is appointed commander-in-chief of the Hungarian First Army on August 1st, he starts looking for ways to defect the entire Hungarian military to the Allies. Meanwhile, Himmler is convinced that the deportations from Hungary will soon resume. On July 31st, he responds to a letter from Martin Muschmann, Gauleiter of Sachsen, and a fanatic Nazi complaining that the genocide is proceeding too slowly in France. In his response, Himmler blames the German military administration in France for an unwillingness to cooperate with deportations but he expresses satisfaction with the progress in Hungary, noting that 450,000 Jews have already been deported with the help of their Hungarian collaborators, he writes. We are now approaching the deportation of the second half of Hungarian Jewry. You can rest assured that precisely in this moment of the war, just as before, I possess the necessary toughness to complete this task. A determination he displayed amply in May and June as the murder operation at Auschwitz went into overdrive. From May to the end of July, 470,000 human beings are slaughtered at Auschwitz, on average 5,100 every day for 91 days. The increasing terror is a deliberate escalation. In May, Himmler removed then Commandant Otto Liebhenschel and appointed Richard Baer in his place. He sent Liebhenschel's predecessor, Rudolf Hoess, in to supervise the transition and to personally oversee the mass murder of the Jewish Hungarians. When that operation completes at the end of July, Hoess hands the reins to Baer. His mission is to cement the camp's purpose of horror and attrition. He was the worst camp commander in Auschwitz. Hoess already led a strict regime, while noticeable reliefs were created under Liebhenschen. All reliefs were removed again after the arrival of Bea. He was a stubborn commander. There was no room for maneuver within which the prisoners, as was the case under Liebhenschel, would have had certain advantages. He was even more radical than Hoess. While Himmler and the other Nazi autocrats plan to continue their murder spree, the first hard evidence of this Nazi genocide is captured by the United Nations Alliance. 
On July 24th, the Soviet Red Army advance overruns the Majdanek camp complex. As we have seen before, like Auschwitz, this is a combined concentration labor and death camp. During Operation Reinhardt in 1942 and 43, and again in Aktion Erntefest, the SS operated shooting pits and gas chambers here, killing in total around 60,000 Jewish men, women, and children, and 20,000 non-Jewish inmates for a variety of reasons. The rest of the camp complex is a traditional concentration camp with the sole purpose of systematically crushing the souls and bodies of Nazi un undesirables, and a slave labor camp producing for the German war effort. In all, 150,000 prisoners will have passed through the camp, including the 80,000 murdered. In July 44, the number of inmates is still in the many thousands, several hundred Jewish slaves, but mostly non-Jews held in slavery. A large portion of them are Soviet POW. The SS is surprised by the speed of the Allied advance. As the Soviets take Lublin, they desperately try to evacuate the remaining prisoners. On the 24th, when the camp is overrun, only about 1,000 have been deported to Auschwitz. Many of them end up on a transport of 3,000 from Tarnov. When it arrives on July 31st and the cattle wagons are opened, the SS find that almost everyone has died or is dying in the wagons that are boiling hot and lacking ventilation in the summer heat. The SS log notes only two female survivors admitted to the camp. As they flee from Majdanek, the SS don't have time to destroy the camp. They do set the crematorium and gas chambers on fire, burning them to the ground, but most of the other structures remain intact. Significant among them are the rows of long mass graves filled with human ashes and bone remnants. In the next weeks, the gruesome discovery of denigration, torture, and murder that liberating troops uncover will be widely publicized in Allied media. While these few thousand Nazi victims have been liberated, there are still hundreds of thousands in Nazi detention. Now, the fate of Europe's Jews has long been decided, but the Nazis' final plan for the Roma and Sinti has never been formally concluded. Tens of thousands have already been murdered, but many remain in slavery, and a large number have been taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau and are held at the Gypsy family camp. On August 1st, there are a total of 4,305 Roma and Sinti registered as Sigoyna, Gypsies, at Auschwitz One and Two. On the evening of August 2nd, two trains pull up to the platform at Birkenau. The SS round up 1,408 Roma and Sinti from the family camp and blocks 10 and 11. The 918 men, 105 boys aged 9 to 14, and 490 teenage and adult women are to be sent as slaves to other camps. As families are torn apart, other camp inmates witness their tearful, all too brief farewells through the netted fence of the family camp. That evening, the family camp is cordoned off. Camp doctor Josef Mengele arrives and calls all Polish inmates working as nurses and medics in the family camp to step forward. They are taken away and sent to work at quarantine camp B2D instead. Then the SS start herding all the men, women, children and babies out of the camp towards the gas chambers. That night, all 2,897 are murdered and thrown into the burning pits as the crematoria are still being serviced after intense overuse. As dawn rises in the misery that is Auschwitz, the only Sinti or Roma alive in the camp are a few twins that Dr. Mengele continues to torture in his laboratory of horrors. There are many more things that happened in the war against humanity this week in 1944. I will get back to that next week and in my extra weekly episodes this month. For now, think of Himmler's way of looking at what he is doing, an irreversible racial realignment of Eastern Europe that goes beyond military success or failure. As I have pointed out before, that is what this war is about, identity. Not the identity people choose or have for themselves, but the identity they believe others to have. A different identity that they believe doesn't fit with their own identities that are somehow seen as a threat to a way of life they have imagined for themselves. 
is based on rosy dreams of a bygone era of identitarian harmony where everyone knew their place, a time when life ran like a steady ticking clock, colors were purer, and progress was yours for the taking without any effort, a time of stagnation, regression, and mental death. Thankfully, a time that never was. And that is, anyway, not what defines humanity. We are a vibrant species that has succeeded to become the planet's apex predator, not based on our strength to enforce uniformity, order, and sameness, not because of our ability to oppress, torture, and kill each other. We have succeeded, not because, but despite those handicaps. Our success, our beauty, our immense capacity to create is grounded in our ability to learn from each other, to open our minds to the endless possibilities of a chaotic world, and to change with it, to create, forge, and embrace a future that our ancestors only imagined. The fuel of that enterprise is diversity, and whether we like it or not, that is what we are. A motley crew of large apes who have been blessed with a smattering of languages, cultures, and ideas. When someone speaks of a culture war or a threat by another identity, that is what they are attacking. You, a beautiful animal with a wonderful brain, because you are different. We all are. Never forget. <laughs>